We begin in the United States, where voting is now underway across the various time zones and in more than half of America's 50 states, with Donald Trump and Kamala Harris neck and neck in the polls to become the next president. It comes after months of sometimes bitter campaigning that have seen two assassination attempts on the Republican candidate Donald Trump and the withdrawal mid-race of President Biden in favor of Kamala Harris. More than 80 million votes have already been cast in early voting, but who turns out today could be decisive. Both campaigns are now concentrating on getting their supporters to the polls. Both campaigns are now concentrating on getting their supporters to the polls. And uh, let's listen in to what the candidates said at their last outing before the, the start of voting. Okay, I'm told the clips of the two candidates uh, is not there. Um, we were rather hoping that we could uh, talk, to, uh, get a sense of what they uh, were saying, uh, the, the, their final sort of push for votes uh, before the uh, voting actually began. Uh, well, let's just remind you of uh, how the system works in America because it all starts to get very mathematical as the results start coming in. 270 electoral college votes is what you need to win the presidential election. That is the manic magic number and those votes are divided out according to the size of the state. So for instance, Wisconsin at the bottom uh, has 10 of the electoral college votes. Uh, Pennsylvania, of course, being seen as the big prize tonight, uh, the big prize to win. It's got 19 electoral college votes and it's seen as crucial to making up the 270 that a candidate needs to get to the White House. Uh, we'll look at those uh, swing states again later in the program. But for his assessment of the American election, I'm joined now uh, on the line from Washington by the U.S. military and current affairs analyst, Doug Brooks, who is the founder of the International Stability Operations Association. Uh, Mr. Brooks, good to see you again. Thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. Uh, just tell us what you've been doing today and what the mood is like where you are in this very sort of consequential election. Yeah, it's a really interesting day. Uh, most uh, I voted uh, early, I think, as uh, many Americans do these days by mail, or you can uh, often go to the, the polls and vote uh, a week ahead or so. Uh, so it is possible to, to vote early. But right now, I mean, today, the, the electioning essentially stopped yesterday in terms of uh, the candidates going out. Uh, they went right up until, I think, 2 a.m. is when Trump finished his final uh, rally. Um, and so today, I mean, there's a lot going on on social media that, that people are tracking and we're trying to get a feel for, um, who's actually showing up to the polls today. Uh, if it's more women, uh, it's indicative that it will be a, a better day for Kamala uh, Harris. And if it's, uh, fewer women, then obviously Trump may have a, an edge. So it's all very close and, uh, and there's, <laughs> there's a lot of speculation going on, but nobody really knows. Can you imagine? But do you agree with those who say that this has been a most extraordinary uh, election campaign? I mean, there were two attempts on the life of Donald Trump. Uh, Midstream, the president pulled out of the race in favor of Kamala Harris. Uh, it's been extremely unusual. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. And interestingly, the two attempts, I mean, what we know about the two attempted assassins is they were both Republicans. Um, so it's uh, it's really kind of crazy. Uh, at the same time, you have um, uh, Trump, I would say, has is, is really run a very uh, aggressive campaign that's, uh, you know, essentially saying that he's going to be throwing his opponents in jail after he gets elected and so on. Um, and that's obviously disturbing but he i think he said that in the past it didn't actually happen but you never know and then of course uh, harris has been trying to uh portray herself as being uh, inclusive and interestingly in her final rallies uh for example she said uh, we're not um we're not creating enemies here we're, we're trying to uh we're planning to put uh, republicans at the table um so she's trying to be as inclusive as possible she's reached out uh, to the Republicans and had uh, um, uh, several hundred prominent Republicans endorse her 
uh, or candidacy this candidate this time. So uh, I, it's clear that the political establishment supports Harris um, largely from the Republicans and and Democrats, um, but uh, Trump has his. Um, essentially this this incredible base of uh, support, especially from the rural areas that uh, will carry him and, and make it a close race no matter what. But I mean, l- let me just um, take you up on that issue of Donald Trump and the kind of um, support that he seems to enjoy um, amongst not just his base, but a lot of other uh, Americans. I mean, what is it in your assessment that gives him that kind of reach into the heart of America? It's been really, really interesting, and that's that's really a, a good question. And there's a lot of um, uh, analysts who say that it has to do with uh, people feeling excluded from the system. There's a lot of um, white uh, resentment towards um, essentially a growing non-white population in the United States. And uh, so I think you're seeing some hostility there that they're sort of venting and taking out by uh, by supporting uh, Trump. And, and it's quite interesting in many ways when you talk to Trump supporters, they're sort of like... Um, um, owning the libs is how they put it. Owning, owning the, uh, the liberals, uh, basically saying, you know, here's our chance to win, and and Trump is is doing that for us. He's, you know, his victory in uh, 2016 uh, was unexpected and really put the uh, uh, the sort of the the uh, the Democratic side uh, on the their back heels because nobody expected that this guy who really pandered to the the darkest sides of the Republican Party would would be able to pull off a victory. Um, And then since 2020, when he had his followers essentially assault the um, uh, Congress and the Capitol, uh, nobody thought he'd be able to make a comeback, but here he is. Um, He was very unpopular at the the January 6th attacks uh, uh, four years ago. Um, but now he has, as you can see, reached up to 50% and made this race um, really uh, a toss-up. Indeed. I'm just listening to you uh, speak there, uh, Doug. Um, I can guess which way you'll be voting, or at least which way you voted, but I'll let you spell it out for us if you <laughs> want to. Uh, sure. I mean, I think uh, for those of us involved in international uh, affairs, um, uh, well, just to make it blunt, I mean, Trump has sort of hinted that he'd be willing to drop out of NATO, for example, or that he'd be willing to stop supporting uh, Ukraine, uh, which uh, embarrassed him when he was president um, because he tried to uh, basically shake them down to give them dirt on his uh, political opponents. Um, the NATO thing, I, I, Trump has never really understood it. And uh, he keeps talking about NATO members not paying their dues. But in fact, NATO has uh, guidelines on how much each country is supposed to put into their defense uh, spending, uh, and some countries would fell below that. The money doesn't come to the United States, but Trump doesn't seem to have quite realized that. And then, of course, on the issue of international trade, uh, and this is a big one for Africa with the GOA and some of the other uh, trade agreements that are going on, um, uh, Trump is not a big fan of international trade, and what he wants to do to essentially fund the um, the deficit in, in the United States is is put these massive tariffs, and I mean humongous tariffs, on everything that's imported to the United States. Um, Trump is, has repeatedly said that he assumes the uh, tariffs are paid by other countries, but in fact, tariffs are paid by the citizens of the country that, that puts the tariffs on. So it's a, essentially a tax on Americans. Uh, Kamala Harris has made this point that essentially – Trump is is planning to put these massive taxes on on U.S. citizens, um, but uh, it doesn't really seem to be uh, sinking in with uh, the base uh, support that that uh, Trump has. But really, I mean, when it comes down to logic and and reason, um, you, you have probably sixty percent of the Republican Party that that make up Trump's core support, and they are you know he's often been called a cult. Um, it's where reason essentially bounces off. I mean, one of his biggest uh, supporting groups are these evangelical Christians who have all sorts of issues with uh, infidelity and so on. And Trump, of course, is a serial, uh, um, uh, has problems with that. And that can, can kind of uh, be ignored by this evangelical community. It's really odd. So, um, 
it's a it's kind of an astonishing election, as you say. Well, indeed, uh, it, just to use your word there, it does come across as rather odd. Um, but beyond those sort of issues that you mentioned, particularly the, on the international scene, I mean, for you as an American who has, of course, voted in this election, what were the big domestic issues that you were thinking about as you went to the ballot? Well, one of the biggest ones in the United States, of course, is the question of abortion and uh, women's control over their body on health issues. Um, and Trump has bragged uh, that he got rid of Roe versus Wade, which was a, a Supreme Court decision which allowed abortion uh, in the United States across the U.S. Uh, Trump uh, was able has basically appointed several of the Supreme Court justices, so they were able to um, to end Roe versus Wade. Uh, during his term, and so now we're we're basically facing, or, or recently, I should say, but now we're facing a situation where every state is deciding uh, on abortion. Now, this issue has really driven some interesting results because state by state, um, the legislatures or the populations are voting on this abortion issue, and overwhelmingly, it's a uh, uh, blue, as we would say, a democratic uh, uh, issue. So, for example, in the state of Kansas, which is a very Republican state, um, they voted overwhelmingly to support uh, a choice or, or support the woman's right to choose on, on abortion issues. Uh, and that's in a really Republican state. That's been fascinating. And so now there's a bunch of initiatives across the U.S. Uh, on abortion. And this is driving women to the polls because they really want to have control over their bodies and not let the the state dictate when they're allowed to, uh, how they handle their their uh, birth control and so on. So it's 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 become that's sort of one of the major issues. Uh, the second issue, of course, is uh, migrants. And uh, like every country in the world, I think, or every uh, industrialized country in the world, there's a issue of people coming to. Uh, work in the economy. The United States has uh, as many as um, 15 or 20 million um, migrants who have not registered or are not um, you know, citizens or don't have green cards, but many of them are actually working in the economy, especially in the agricultural economy. Um, and so they actually do a lot to drive the sort of booming economy we have in the United States. But there's also a lot of resentment, especially from uh, the core supporters of, of Trump about these people, mainly coming from Central America and, and Latin America, uh, that are in the United States, and and uh, according to the um, the anti migrant uh, people, these the migrants are costing uh, billions of dollars to the United States. I, I think the uh, libertarian and the the uh, uh, pro migrant side. Uh, actually see similarities with the past. Uh, like my ancestors were Irish uh, that came over in the 1860s and 70s uh, running or fleeing the uh, uh, famine in Ireland. And uh, were they all legal according to U.S. law and everything? Maybe, maybe not. This, we're finding an awful lot of them, even back then, weren't filling out the forms correctly and so on. Uh, now we have much more restrictions on immigrants. Um, but nevertheless, uh, our economy actually relies on, on these people doing a lot of the, the sort of menial work that, that, um, that many people don't want to do the cleaning, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, agricultural, you know, um, work in the fields and so on. And it's miserable work, but it, people coming from countries where their economies are tanked, uh, Venezuela, for example, um, uh, it's a, actually, they can make a lot more money up here and send it home. So uh, it's a difficult question, but uh, I would say abortion, migration, those are really the two big issues. Crime is another one. Right. And a lot of that comes from the whole disinformation. Crime is actually down, but um, uh, you see, Trump uh, actually could, continually claims that, that Crime has gone up under. Yep. under I, I've very, heard very him strange. say that a, a number of times. Um, it, it is really quite fascinating. Um, I imagine it's even more fascinating for you as an American because uh, across the world, people are watching it very, very keenly. But I want to thank you very much indeed, Doug, for joining us and for giving us your uh, analysis. Uh, Doug Brooks uh, is a U.S. military and current affairs analyst, founder of the International Stability Operations Association, and he was talking to me there on the line from Washington.